Today I want to share with you my most successful deadlift programming ever. <laughs> From April to December 2017, I put 44 pounds on my deadlift, going from a 606 deadlift to a 650 deadlift after being stuck around 600 pounds for two years. I used to pull conventional, and I deadlifted 600 pounds for the first time in February of 2015 at a body weight of about 205 pounds. I was really excited to hit this new milestone, but that excitement quickly wore off when I made absolutely no progress in the following several months. Because of my lack of progress, I decided to try some new things out with my deadlift. I decided to start deadlifting sumo. Um, without really ever training my sumo, it was, around the, it was around 550 pounds. When my conventional was 600, I'd been training it for years. So my thought process was, with very little training, my sumo is already fairly strong, so it should quickly surpass my conventional if, as soon as I start focusing on it. Unfortunately, things did not go as planned, and my sumo deadlift suffered the same problem that my conventional did. It was making very little or no progress. It eventually caught up to my conventional, but it took up until October of 2016 to finally deadlift 600 pounds. By April of 2017, I was still stuck at a, a very similar weight of 606 in competition. Throughout this time, I tried many different types of programming. I tried very high specificity programs like Shaco, and I've even tried some, program, some daily undulating programs like PH3. And it didn't really seem to matter what kind of programming I did, my deadlift was always very, very slowly progressing or not progressing at all. After my competition in April of 2017, I decided to do all of my own programming from that point forward, and I decided to do a daily undulating periodization program with a lot of variability focusing on my weak points. With this new programming, I was able to put 44 pounds on my deadlift with only a 5 pound change in body weight. I decided to make my program use daily undulating periodization. Because of some of the success I'd had on Lane Norton's PH3 program with my squat and bench press, I figured with a little bit of change in exercise selection, I could make this type of periodization work for my deadlift. This type of periodization allowed me to focus on developing the strength of my deadlift and simultaneously develop the size of all the muscles involved as well. Now let's get to exercise selection. Of course, the most important movement on any deadlift program is going to be the competition deadlift. If you don't have sufficient specific volume, then it's unlikely that your programming is going to be any good. This is because the best way to get better at something is to do a lot of that something. Performing your competition deadlift for a lot of weekly volume is going to allow you to become maximally proficient in the movement and build up the strength in all the muscles that are most important. Next, let's talk about accessory work. When choosing your accessory movements, you need to have a specific goal to accomplish with each movement. I noticed that my deadlift, like many other sumo deadlifters, is weakest right off the floor and I have a hard time keeping my knees out. So because of this, I decided my first accessory movement was going to be the deficit sumo deadlift. This exaggerated my starting position by putting me on a two inch deficit. I felt this would be a good way to improve my starting position and loose, by loosening my adductors and improve my end range of motion strength. By doing this movement with strict form, I felt that I greatly improved my mobility and end range of motion strength, especially in the muscle groups that are involved for externally rotating the knee at the bottom of the sumo deadlift. I feel that of all of my accessory movements, this is the one most responsible for my deadlift progress. Next, I did some movements that only serve the purpose to help build my hamstrings, glutes, and back. They're not very specific to the deadlift, however, they target a lot of the same muscle groups. These movements are going to be the good morning and the stiff-legged deadlift. I've done a lot of good mornings in the past on my Shaco programming, and I felt that it was a very effective movement for my hamstrings especially. So I felt that adding a similar movement in, like the stiff-legged deadlift, would help further develop these muscle groups. I'm not sure that there's much advantage doing one of these over the other, However, I had limited options in my home gym for hamstring work, so I decided to add both of these in just for some variability. Later in my program, I decided to swap out my deficit sumo deadlifts for some pause sumo deadlifts as I got closer to my mock meet. My thought process here was that I need an accessory that's a little more specific to the competition deadlift. Later in my programming, I noticed that I was kind of sloppily cheating my way through a part of the range of motion. I would use the momentum off the floor to kind of launch me all the way up to my lockout, and then I would just have to struggle with a lockout. I noticed in my mid-range of motion, I was failing to keep the bar against my shins and stay in proper position. By forcing myself to pause during this mid-range of motion, it ensured that I would maintain proper bar position. If I tried to pause with a weight when it was far away from my shins, I would be unable to do so. So the only way I could complete this movement is to do it properly. Another important change I made during this time is I put a little bit more focus on mobility. I was trying to stretch my adductors at least a few times a week. This greatly improved one of the problems I talked about earlier in this video, that is my tight hamstrings and poor start position. So here I have a very rough weekly layout of this routine. As you can see, it is a very high frequency routine. You are training a lower body lift five days per week. So as you can see on your Tuesday, by the time you go to do competition deadlifts, you will have already had some fatigue from your squatting on Monday and same situation with your deadlifting on Saturday. What makes this kind of routine possible is if you keep the training volume and training intensity manageable so you can recover between sessions. I also would not recommend this training style to someone who is a beginner or to someone who is used to a low training frequency. 
I believe that anyone who's wanting to do this, who is not, should gradually work their way up to this frequency. Even though this video is all about deadlifting, we cannot really talk about a deadlift program without addressing the squatting that's happening at the same time because they work the same muscle groups. So we'll briefly address this. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I do some squat variation. Usually competition squat Monday, Wednesday is a lighter squat variation like safety squats, and then Friday is like a moderate, um, a moderate intensity squat variation. It can be comp competition squat again, or it could be a high bar squat. So immediately following Monday's competition squat session, I have to go to Tuesday's competition deadlift session. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to recover from, but like I said, Monday needs to be a manageable squat workout. So after Tuesday's competition deadlifts, I have an accessory squat, usually like a safety squat on Wednesday, and I follow this up with good morning and ab training. Um, both of these I included here in this talk because I felt they were relevant to the deadlift training. And then Thursday I get a rest day for my lower body, and Friday I do another squat variation, and I follow it immediately on Saturday with a deficit deadlift, stiff-legged deadlift, and ab workout. And of course Sunday is one more rest day. I really need that extra rest day before going back into the three lower body workouts in a row on Monday through Wednesday. Now let's take a more detailed look at each training block. This routine is divided up into mostly four week training blocks and usually pick a percentage based starting weight. We'll pretend this is the first block of this training routine and we'll start with uh, sets of six on the competition deadlift and sets of eight on stiff legged deadlift and sets of ten on deficit deadlift. I think it's very important to start with weights that are very manageable just because of how frequently I was training and how much volume I'll be using. So for the first week, I'll start with 70% on competition deadlift for three sets of six. Deficit and stiff-legged deadlifts will both be done with three sets as well. Neither of these should exceed an RPE of eight. I like to keep these fairly light, otherwise I really feel like I'll get beat up on this routine. The main goal within each block is to increase weight and volume from week to week. If I have to choose one, I choose the to increase volume and only increase weight if you are able to. For example, if week one was difficult, I would not add weight on week two, but chances are 70% for sets of six is very manageable, so you can add five or 10, 15 pounds and go up to 71 or 72%. But the more important change between week one and week two is to add a set of competition deadlifts. I like to make this fourth set an AMRAP, and I get to use that to kind of gauge my progress. If my AMRAP is a whole lot of reps, then I add more weight for week three. If my AMRAP is only six or seven reps, then I keep the weight the same. Now between weeks two and three, instead of adding another set to my competition deadlift, I add a set to my deficit deadlift, now bringing my total working sets up to four on competition deadlift and four on deficit deadlift. So from week one to week three, I've sufficiently increased volume and increased weight on competition deadlift. I don't like to force weight change on deficit deadlift or stiff leg deadlift unless those movements are very easy. Now week four is a really fun change up. I like to take a deload at the beginning of the week because I've accumulated a lot of fatigue usually by this point. Three weeks of this routine is very hard. So I do like a competition deadlift for three sets of five at 55 or 65%, just whatever you feel like will let you recover well. And then at the end of the week, I do an AMRAP on all three of my competition lifts. And I use this AMRAP to help me gauge progress and help me estimate a one rep max for my next training block. So for example, if you started this training block with a 590 deadlift max, you would be doing an AMRAP at the end of the block with a 500 pound deadlift. If you got this deadlift for 10 reps, and you know based on your personal history that 10 reps is 80% for you, then your new deadlift max for next block will be 625. And that will take us to our next training block. So on the previous block, we're doing sets of 6, 8, and 10. On this block, we'll do 4, 6, and 8, and increase the weight slightly. So I'll start the competition deadlift with 80%, and then I'll still keep the deficit deadlift and stiff-legged deadlift based on RPE only. And the, prog the progression here is the exact same, and then at the end of this, instead of doing the same 85%, I would do 90% of my new estimated one rep max. And then once this training block is done, you can go back to your block of 6, 8, 10, or you can go up to blocks of 8, 10, 12, or if you're getting near competition, you can go even lower and do 3, 5, 7. It just depends what you need to do. But I feel like you can't go wrong cycling between your 4, 6, 8 and your 6, 8, 10, which is where I spent the majority of my training blocks. Although this program is pretty successful, there are a few things I feel that I could have done better. The training block in the 8 to 12 rep range was absolutely no fun at all, and it was also my worst progress. Though I only ran the block one time, so this could have been a fluke. However, I think I, would, my, I will avoid this rep range. My 4 to 8 and 6 to 10 rep range blocks were much more successful. Having a lot fewer stressors in my life from late July to September would have been very helpful as well. During this time, I was studying for my Step 1 exam for medical school, and I started my first rotations for a third year of medical school, which was a very stressful rotation. Lack of sleep and stress in general certainly must have hindered some progress, as I can actually notice my progress slowed down during this time. 
I think that adding some more variation in movements at some point would have been good. I think that going about six months or so with the exact same movements is not optimal. Though I did vary the rep range, I think that every few training blocks I should have probably swapped out pause deadlifts for my deficit deadlifts and maybe a snatch grip deadlift for my for my stiff legged deadlift. After a few months, I feel that accessory movements can kind of become stale and no longer have the same effect they did when you first introduced them. Another thing I could have done differently was to gain more weight. I could have got them to 240, 245 and then cut back down to my weight class later. I think that I've made even more progress on all of my lifts. In order to summarize a few key factors responsible for my recent deadlift success, here are a few takeaway points. I ran a high frequency daily undulating periodization program with a moderate amount of specific volume. I followed this with lots of volume and accessory movements specifically tailored to my weaknesses. And finally, I was able to improve my hip mobility through certain exercises and stretches. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hopefully some of this can help you with your own deadlift programming. If you like this kind of content, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I'll be making videos like this regularly. If you have any questions, go ahead and just post them in the comments. And I'll do my best to answer them. Have a great dang day.